Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Thank you for joining us online for at, at, right here at Oak Grove PH Church uh, on, on Facebook Live. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, I want to welcome all of our moms. I know that we still have some people that are joining. And uh, the way Facebook goes out is when you do these live videos, they send out a bunch of notifications. And, um, you know, if not everybody joins right at the, right at the exact time. But uh, listen, I want to wish you a happy Mother's Day. Um, I know that you may have some plans with your families and with your moms. And I don't care what they say about this whole COVID-19 thing. Nothing's keeping us away from family. Uh, I'm leaving whenever I leave service today. I'm going straight to my mom's house and I'm spending time with her. Um, and so listen, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that and get, giving her the gift that, I, that Bridget and I bought her. And, um, and speaking of gifts, listen, I want to go ahead and do this. So one thing that I brought up to uh, your, your administrative council was I said, hey, uh, I know that every year that Oak Grove honors their mothers whenever we have a Mother's Day service. And then they recognize, and usually I think it's three mothers. Uh, it, may, it may be a little bit different, so please pardon me if I'm not correct on that. But um, I know that you recognize a handful of mothers that are in your service and attend. And so I brought this idea up, and they, and, and they liked it. And, uh, and so this is what we're going to do. We're gonna, I've got a bowl here with a bunch of mothers' names. I'm going to ask Ryan if he'll join me. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw three mothers' names from this, uh, from this bowl. And I've asked Ryan, I kind of put him on the spot this morning, uh, because I don't want to mispronounce, mispronounce a name, yep. and I don't want to get mad at me while I go <laughs> preach. And so, <laughs> uh, so we're going to draw three names from this bowl, and uh, then those three mothers get one of these gift baskets. And so uh, Ryan, Rochelle, and, 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 and I'm sure they've had some help put, put together these, these gifts, and uh, so, listen, I'm not sure if we'll get these delivered today, but we'll try we'll to do the best we can. I'll work with yes. Ryan to make sure. I'll help however I can as well. Uh, and so, listen, you ready? We're ready. All right, I'm going to hand you the mic. I'm okay. going to hold the bowl, and then we'll just kind of go from there. All right, sounds good. All right, let's see who we have. We have Dean Gaskins. All right. Happy Mother's Day, Miss Dean. Let's make sure we get that mixed up. <laughs> we have uh, Joyce Wiggins. Happy Mother's Day, Miss Joyce. Aunt Joyce, I should say. Yeah, get it right. Get it right. And we have Tanya Dantzler. Happy Mother's Day, Tanya. Thank, thank you, Rod. Happy Mother's Day. Congratulations to those three moms. And I know this is a little bit different than what you're used to, but you you won yourself a, a gift basket, and so we'll give that to you today, or we'll be able to tr try to get that to you within, if not today, I'm sure tomorrow, uh, but listen, we're not going to let it go go too long, so um, I'm excited about today's about today's message. I'm going to be honest with you, I'm, I'm going to do my best to keep this as short as possible, uh, but God has put a lot on my heart today, and so what I want to do is, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to read verse 5. And then I think we should have time for this. And so turn here as well as Joshua chapter 2. And uh, we're going to read about Rahab in the first 11 verses. So Matthew chapter five, or chapter 1 verse 5 and then Joshua chapter 2 uh, verses 1 through 11. And... Uh, over the last couple of weeks, I've been preparing the sermon. I've been praying, asking God, you know, what is it that he want me to share? And because it's Mother's Day, I keep thinking about my mom. I've never preached a Mother's Day sermon, and so this was a challenge for me, something that, you know, it's very easy for a preacher to stand up and to give a very simple Mother's Day message. It's very easy for us to just kind of come in and not really expect a lot from the word because it's a special day, and, and, and especially because you have plans. But I began to think about my mom, and I got to thinking about what God wanted me to say, and as I was preparing, I want you to know that we are going to use an example of a mother in, the, in this sermon, but this is not a sermon for mothers. This is a sermon for fathers. This is a sermon for every church member who comes to this church, that we can use an example of a mom to challenge ourselves to live up to that same example. And I got to thinking about my mom and how much 
of an influence she played or she has played and continues to play in my life. My mom is the number one spiritual influencer for me, and I, I can't really speak for my brother, but I know he has, I, I know she has been for me. My mom taught my Sunday school class in the beginner's class from like three to five years old. When I went to the primary class again, at some somehow she made the jump from the beginner's class to the primary's class, and she taught me there. And I remember the very first time going into a Sunday school class, and the teacher was not my mom. It was Miss Lynette Ackerman. And a lot of people know Miss Lynette, love Miss Lynette. She is like a second mom to me. And, but it felt weird to walk into a classroom and my mom was not the teacher. I, I, I got used to it. Listen, I adjusted to it, but it just felt odd. When I would go to bed at night, my mom didn't read me bedtime stories. Instead, she taught me how to memorize and recite the Lord's Prayer. That before I lay down and actually close my eyes to go to sleep, we would actually recite the Lord's Prayer from memory. And I didn't always get it correct, but eventually I got it. But my mom taught me the Lord's Prayer. But on top of all of those things, when I get to Matthew chapter 1, I, I, I read the words and I know that it's there. But let me be completely clear. Matthew chapter 1, the first half of that chapter is actually pretty boring. It's nothing but a, a genealogy to Jesus. Now, there's some good stuff, and we're going to get into to, to, to verse 5 here in a moment. But it's kind of a boring half of a chapter. Uh, but I don't think so much about that. When I read Matthew 1, I think about my mom because growing up from my ages of about 5 or let's say 6 to 10, we traveled with two different Southern Gospel groups. Some of you will actually know who these groups are. The first one was the Singing Couriers with Jim and Julius Bunch out of Bennettsville, South Carolina. Uh, they're, they're considered to be an extended family. I mean, they're not actually family or blood relation, but man, they always felt like family. They came and they'd spend the night at our house, and whenever they would come around to Oak Grove and they perform here, they would go to Mont's Corner, PH, or Cordsville, or wherever we would go around this area of Berkeley County. They would generally come and spend the night. Somebody would spend the night at my house and kick me out of my bed and make me sleep on the couch. But we traveled with them, and it was with the Singing Dees family out of Georgetown with Ronald and Susie Dees. And I wasn't in the band. I was, I was too young. But we traveled to churches that I don't even remember the churches, all the churches that we went to. And I can tell you some stories about it, but what I remember the most were two things. Number one, I remember my mom having to keep me still in church. Children's church is one of the greatest inventions in modern day, at least around here. Children's ministries is so great because while there are some very well-mannered kids that will sit in church, there are others that we know your kid, I mean your kids, they make some distractions. I'm pretty sure if I had a kid, my kid would be one of those ones that make a distraction. And I would just be happy, and Bridget would just be happy to send our kid to children's church and let that teacher handle it. I didn't have that as a kid. I was, I was lucky if my mom let me take, like, G.I. Joe's to church so I could play and be quiet in the pew while the, while the preacher preached. If I didn't have toys or, like, matchbox cars or something, I would have a, a notebook. And I draw pictures and stuff in, in my notebook and it would keep me company. But if I didn't have any of that, honestly, all I had was a hymnal and a Bible. And I'd pull one out of the back of the pew of the church, uh, wherever we were sitting normally in one of the first few rows. And sometimes when I pull that Bible out, for some reason, it just felt logical to start reading in Matthew chapter one. And I know not everyone has an, has an example like that. But, but listen, when you're bored as a kid, you find something to keep you entertained. And so I'd pull that Bible out and I'd open up to Matthew 1, and it wasn't so much the words that I remember reading, it was the fact that I was sitting next to my mom as I was reading it. And I would watch her listen to the sermon, or I would watch her sing the songs that was with that singing group. And we're talking about not just something that lasted for an hour or an hour and a half of service. We're talking about homecomings and revivals, and we're talking about special singing services that lasted for two or three hours. Going to a watch night service that some of you remember, you would start around 10 o'clock at night, and you would just go all night long. 
These were the types of services that I watched my mom live out her faith, not only in church, but out of church. And so preparing for this sermon, I thought about her and the spiritual influence she had on my life because watching her impacted me to become the person that I am today as a pastor. It impacted my brother, who is now the pastor of Hickory Grove. And my mom not only taught in church for 30 years, she taught youth ministry and children's ministries and Sunday school and whatever for 30 years. But she also ran, uh, she was an assistant director at Providence Baptist right down the road for four or five years. She ran an after school program at 10PH for five years. My mom has not only impacted her kids, but she's impacted uh, not just kids now, but now teens and young adults and into their 30s and 40s all around Berkeley County. And I thought about her legacy on how she has simply just tried to live out her faith and how much it has to do with Rahab and, and, and Rahab's legacy. It's not exactly the same, but Rahab has a similar re a legacy of passing on her faith. Matthew chapter 1 verse 5 states it like this, and I'm reading from the Christian Standard Bible Translation. It says, Salmon fathered Boaz by Rahab. Boaz fathered Obed by Ruth. Obed fathered Jesse. Now, I'm not going to get caught up in the whole name of Salmon or Salmon or Sal however you want to say it. The research that I found, it says that his pronunciation was closer to like a Salma, like S-A-L-M-A, but he got married to a woman named Rahab. They had a kid named Boaz, which we know is the Boaz from the book of Ruth. All right. Boaz gets married to Ruth in that book. They have a kid named Obed. Obed ends up being the father of Jesse. And if you go into verse 6, you find out that Jesse is the father of King David. Matthew chapter 1, in the first half of that chapter, it does talk about the genealogy of Jesus. And there are 42 generations that are listed in that genealogy. There are 14 generations, if I did my math right, there's 14 generations that go from Abraham to to King David, 14 generations from King David to the Babylonian exile and 14 generations from that exile to Jesus. And so that makes it 42 generations. And there are men listed all throughout from Abraham all the way to Jesus. There are men listed in every single generation, men that are rightfully so deserving to be listed in that heritage of who Jesus Christ is, our Messiah and Savior. And there are five, there are only five women. And I'm not going to try to talk about the discrepancy between that. I'm just saying that since those five women, there's something about their lives that gives them credit and honors them by being listed. You have Tamar, you have Rahab, you have Ruth, you have Bathsheba and the Virgin Mary. All five of them are listed. And as I began to research over all of these women, trying to get an idea, I almost... I almost came, came this morning with the mentality, you know what, I'm going to preach on all, all five of these women that I realized I was going to have you in a video for like two or three hours, and all of you was going to quit at about 20 minutes. So I decided to focus down on Rahab and Ruth, because Ruth is Rahab's daughter-in-law. And I thought, how cool is it that you have these two family members that are listed in the same verse because of the legacy of Rahab. Rahab is not a Jewish woman. All right. Um, she is from the city of Jericho. And as you remember in Joshua chapter one, it starts off that God speaks to Joshua. And he says, my servant Moses is dead. Like he shoots it straight out. He gives him straight to the point. Moses is now dead and he passes on the, the mantle of leadership to Joshua. 
Joshua leads the Israelites across the Jordan River. They've already taken out the Amorites. They've already done, you know, the, the, the long trip through the desert and the wilderness. Now it's time to go take on the promised land. They go across into Canaan. They cross that Jordan into Canaan. And it says that the very first city that they're coming to is the city of Jericho. So that's when we pick up. I'm just going to go ahead and read this because I know I've got time. Joshua chapter 2 verse 1. It says, Now Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two men as spies from the Acacia Grove, saying, Go and scout the land, especially Jericho. So they left and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. Now, Joshua sends two spies into Jericho, and he doesn't just send them straight to Jericho. He says, spy on the land, but specifically go, and I need to know what's going on in Jericho. So these two spies go in and actually sneak in the gate and are now inside the city walls of Jericho. And as they wander around, word gets out that these two spies are there and who those spies are. And so they end up going to the house of Rahab, who is a prostitute. Now Rahab's family owned a tavern on the edge of the city of Jericho. And Rahab was a prostitute in that tavern. To put it into perspective, imagine that you're watching a western and someone comes out of the, you know, a cattleman comes out off the ranch or they, they go into town and as they, and, and you know, they've been by themselves for a while or maybe they've had some other men, but they basically, they say, you know what, we're going to go into the saloon. And when they go into the saloon, there are some women there and you know what those women are for. That's Rahab. Rahab is a prostitute who works in the family tavern. And so it is very natural for foreigners, for people who do not live in Jericho, to come into the city and find themselves frequently visiting a tavern where there is a woman that they can enjoy some time with. So naturally, the king knows that these spies are going to go there. So we continue, and it says, The king of Jericho was told, Look, some of the Israelite men have come here tonight to investigate the land. Then the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab and said, Bring out the men who came to you and entered your house, for they came to investigate the entire land. The king of Jericho knows these men have gone to Rahab. Somehow, some way, maybe it's just a hunch, we don't know. But the king knows those men have gone to uh, Rahab's tavern. And it would have been, it wouldn't have been uncommon for men like that to have gone to her tavern. So, so the king sends word, he goes, goes to Rahab, they knock on the door, Rahab, we want you to send these men out, these men have come to investigate the land, I'm sure that maybe they explained, they're, you know, they're not from Canaan, they're from this Israelite, don't you know what they've done, don't you know that they have the power of God to destroy this place, and so Rahab does this, it says, but the woman had taken the two men and hidden them, so she said, yes, the men did come to me. But I didn't know where they were from. At nightfall, when the city gate was about to close, the men went out, and I don't know where they are going. Chase after them quickly, and you can catch up with them. But she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them among the stalks of flax that, that, had, or that she had arranged on the roof. The men pursued them along the road to the fords of the Jordan, and as soon as they had left, to pursue them, the city gate was shut. So when word was sent to Rahab, Rahab tells the king and lies to the king, the men did come here, you are right, they came here, but they are not here anymore. They actually left, and I don't know where they went. I'm pretty certain that before it hit nightfall, they left out of the gate, and they took off. And I'm sure your men are fast enough that if they get outside the gate before the gates are closed, they can go after them and catch up to them if they act quickly. So the, so the men leave, the soldiers leave, whoever the king had sent, they left, and they rush out of the gate, and they go after these men who didn't leave. They're being hidden up on Rahab's roof. It says among the stalks of flax. Now flax was used, if I'm not mistaken, the flax was used to dye fabric. So Rahab was someone who could take, let's say, like white fabric and she could dye it a color. 
And she had arranged these stalks up on her roof on where she would do this stuff. And she hid them underneath those stalks of flax. Continuing on in verse 8, it says, Before the men fell asleep, she went up on the roof and said to them, Rahab went and talked to the spies, and she says, I know. Now listen, this is, this is the key part right here. I know that the Lord has given you this land and that the terror of you has fallen on us. And everyone who lives in the land is panicking because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings, you completely destroyed across the Jordan. When we heard this, we lost heart and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Rahab makes two statements that are very similarly related. She says one in, it was in verse 8 and then she says another one in verse 11. But basically her point is this. She says that we have heard what you have done to the other kingdoms and the other cities in your passing from the Red Sea to here. We know of your story in Egypt and how you left out of Egypt and we know what happened when you were at the Red Sea and your God dried up the land. You crossed over the, the, the Red Sea on the, the dry seabed. You crossed over. When you got to the Amorite kings, you completely destroyed their kingdoms. And now you are here and we know that the Lord has given you this land. And, 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 and Rahab goes on to say, not only do we know the power that is at force in your life and in the life of your people. She says, but I personally know that we stand no chance against your God. We stand no chance against your people. Your God will give you this land because your God is the God in heaven and on earth. But Rahab is not a Jewish woman. Rahab looked around and saw the evidence and it proved to her that the God of the people of Jericho and the strength of the people of Jericho are no match for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She makes a declaration of faith. I no longer believe in what I've been taught my whole life. I now believe your God is God. And she sees an opportunity for that God to make her life better. So she makes a bargain with these two spies. She says, if I help you escape, you have to spare my life and the lives of, the, of, of my family members. And so that's exactly what happens. She helps those spies escape. They tell her the plan. They say, put, a, put, put, put something outside your window. I don't have time to go into all the details. Put, I put something outside your window. We'll know it's your house. And here's what happens. When they get back to Joshua, Joshua rallies the troops, brings them in. We know the story of the, of the battle of Jericho that really wasn't a battle at all. On how they marched around Jericho for so many days. And on the seventh day they marched around. And on the last time they marched they shouted out. And they had their trumpets. And they made a loud rushing just crashing noise. And it said that the walls of Jericho fell down. And, and they killed every man, woman, child and animal in that city. And everything was gone except for Rahab's tavern. Now think about that. The home of a prostitute was saved by God. Everything else was gone except Rahab and her family. And Joshua tells his men, he says, you go find Rahab and you bring her and her family out. And he keeps the promise made by those spies. But guess what? Rahab will never be a Jewish woman. For the rest of her life, despite her Declaration of faith. Rahab does not belong to those people. She will always live as a foreigner 
in a land of God's chosen people, knowing that she is not God's chosen. She has no authority and no rights. She has nothing, literally nothing, except the charity and the goodwill and the hospitality of the people who have just destroyed her city. She's never going to be one of them. Despite her declaration of faith and despite her faith in the one true God, because she told those spies, I believe that your God is the Lord God of heaven and of earth. She's never going to be one of those people. And so she leaves Jericho. She moves on and she travels with the Israelites. And I don't, we really don't know what else happens to her because a lot of what I just talked about was in, if I'm not mistaken, Joshua chapter 6. We don't know much else about Rahab's life, but I'll tell you one thing. We know. She got married and had a son. At some point in her life, now while we don't know this from the word, we have to think about it hypothetically and kind of put our imagination to it. God took Rahab from being a prostitute in the city of Jericho and eventually allowed her to marry an honorable Jewish man. That alone is a radical transformation. Rahab is considered to be the first Gentile salvation from an Old Testament standpoint. And we're just still, still talking about the Old Testament. But look through everything else before this. And you don't generally find any people outside of God's chosen people, the Israelites, that are given an opportunity to be saved like this. Rahab made a declaration of faith and not only did it save her physically, but it saved her spiritually because now she is allowed to be a part of the God's people by marrying an honorable man. God took a prostitute that's from a dishonorable career and a dishonorable lifestyle and made her an honorable woman. Because that's what God does. God transforms people from a life they used to live and the sin that's in their lives and he transforms them and from a New Testament, now that, now that we're in the New Testament, he transforms them through the power and the blood of Jesus Christ to make us honorable and saved people. Rahab is experiencing that, experiencing that over the course of her life. And then she has a son named Boaz. And Boaz ends up marrying a woman named Ruth. Now, I'm not going to read to you the story of Ruth because I know what time I'm at and I know I don't have it. But to quickly kind of get you to understand who Ruth is, Ruth is just like Rahab. Ruth married a Jewish man. Basically, she had a mother-in-law named Naomi. Naomi is a Jewish woman who married a Jewish man. They lived around Bethlehem, but they moved to Moab after they had a couple of sons. So it was, it was Naomi and her husband, and then they had two sons, and then they moved to Moab. And then those, her, her sons married Moabite women as wives, so they took on these Moabite women, these foreigners, as wives and lived in the land of Moab. And then it said Naomi's husband died, and then her sons died, so there was three women who lived together and none of them had a man to take care of them. And, and, and at that time, that's what happened. The, the husband took care of the wives and, uh, and, and if the husband died, then the brothers took care or, or the sons took care of their mom. But then the, the sons died, so there's no man there to take care of them. So basically, they're just out on their luck. Anything can happen to them. And they're left to fend for themselves. And so Naomi has this idea. She says, you know what? I'm going to move back to Bethlehem because I've got family in Bethlehem and they'll take care of me there. And so she looks at her daughters-in-law and she says, I want you to leave and go back to wherever you're from and marry Moabite men. And while one of them does that, Ruth looks at her mother-in-law and makes this declaration. She says, where you go, I'll go. And your people will be my people and your God will be my God. But the problem is that she is a Moabite woman. And at the time, the Jewish 
kingdom or, or, or the Jewish nation or whatever you want to call it was at odds with Moab because Moab comes from the incestuous relationship with, with, with Lot and his daughters. And so these two people did not get along. And in fact, it tells us that the Moabites would never be accepted into the fellowship of the Jewish people, even to the 10th generation. So they were not allowed. So when, so when Ruth makes the statement, your people will be my people, that is, a, that is a statement that she can never live up to. I believe in your God. I believe because of my, because of my husband and because of, because of my, my dead father-in-law, I believe that your God is the God and I will trust him and he will be my God. But, when he, but, but whenever she says your people will be my people, that's a statement she can't live up to. And so Naomi and Ruth leave and go back to Bethlehem. And while they're there, they find favor with a man named Boaz. And he wasn't the only one, but they, they, they took care of these women. And they gave these women jobs in order to help them tend fields in order to have some food. And I'm, I, I'm oversimplifying the story here for the sake of time. But these women were still struggling after they went to Bethlehem. But there came a point in time when Ruth found favor with Boaz. And she begs Boaz, redeem us, buy back Naomi's land, redeem our lives and help us have a better life. And Boaz is now stuck at a decision point. He is stuck at a point of what do I do? Do I go and redeem these women or women? Or how, do, how in the world am I allowed to do this for Ruth? She is a Moabite woman. I see Naomi, Naomi's family. I can go, but if I, if I go and redeem Naomi, I've got to take Ruth on as a wife. I can't, I can't do this. Plus, there's another man who's supposed to do this anyway. But I imagine that Rahab talked to her son. Raising her son, she would share her testimony of what God had done for her. How God had saved her from Jericho. And how God had transformed her life from being a prostitute to being an honorable woman. And she began to influence her son to sharing about the power of God. The goodness of God. And that their God is the God of heaven and of earth. And she's looking at her son. And, I, and again, I'm having to use my imagination here. But I imagine that Rahab tells her son Boaz. This is the same thing God did for me. This is the same thing your father did for me. And now you have an opportunity to be that same person to Ruth. You have the opportunity to be an honorable man and to make her an honorable woman. She's already declared her faith to leave her land to come live here. And you have the opportunity to show the power of God in her life and to be a good man to her. And so Boaz goes to the city gates the next day and he makes arrangements and he buys back Naomi's land and redeems her. And he takes Ruth on as a wife. It doesn't matter what other people think and it doesn't matter what other people want to say about the situation. Boaz does the right thing. All because his mother shared her heart and her life and her faith with her son. And now both of these women are listed in Matthew chapter 1 verse 5. In the most honorable way that these women probably could be listed. And that is in the lineage of Jesus. We can read their stories and we can see more details into their stories. But if you think about it. These women went from nothing. To being honored in the best way that I think they could be honored. Their life was radically transformed. Rahab by her faith in God and Ruth by the legacy of her now new mother-in-law. 
and her own faith. And, and Rahab's faith is so worth recognizing that she's not only mentioned in the places that I've said, but in the New Testament, she's actually used as an example in James chapter 2, when James talks about the difference between faith and works. He uses Rahab's example. The Apostle Paul himself uses Rahab's example in Hebrews chapter 11 and mentions her with likely names such as Abraham and Sarah. And Hebrews chapter 11 is the faith chapter, as we like to call it. And it lists almost like a hall of fame of people who had extreme faith in God. All because... A mother was willing to pass down her faith to her children. And then I imagine that Boaz and Ruth passed that down to Obed. And Obed passed it down to Jesse. And while Jesse, there's some details about Jesse's life that makes you bring some things into question. But it was passed down through Jesse to King David. And David was described by God as a man after God's own heart. And so I think about all of that in the concept of a mother. And I told you when I got started that this is not a sermon to mothers. It is. But this is also a sermon to fathers. Because you have the same responsibility. The same obligation to influence your kids. But here's the thing. This is for every church member. When my church, my church, we had service and it started at 1030 this morning. And I'm going to wrap up here, here in a few minutes. I'm going to go ahead, I'll go ahead and say that. When my church started at 1030, my pastor's wife, we normally have someone who opens the service up and prays. And my pastor's wife got up and she made a very profound, a simple and profound statement that stuck with me uh, in preparation for this sermon. And she said that um, basically it was she... She's always wanted to be a mom, but there was one thing that she had a goal in life, and that was that her kids get to heaven. And I think about my mom and how I think that was a goal of my mom, too. That it's great if Doug and I have great marriages, and my brother, he's now got two fantastic twin boys, and I hope to be a father one day myself. But what does all that matter if my parents didn't share their faith with us. We wouldn't be pastors today. We wouldn't be the men of God who we are today if my mom did not play her part too and influence and lead us. And we as a church, and I think about it, and I mentioned this at the beginning, but my mom didn't just impact her son's lives. She impacted the lives of so many kids in and out of church and the daycare and the after school program. And I wonder how many of us are leaving that same legacy here at Oak Grove. That I know I'm not, I'm, I'm not a member of Oak Grove. I don't attend church here. I, I come in and out when I can. But I wonder how many of you as church members are pouring into the teenagers of this church. And how many of you are pouring into the kids that are in Sunday school classes and in children's church on Sunday mornings, but not just the children. How many of you are impacting and mentoring and helping those that may not be as spiritually mature as yourself? That's the legacy that we leave. I'll end it on this. Ephesians chapter 1 talks about how God has given us an inheritance. And we like to talk about how that inheritance or think about how that, that inheritance is something that God gives to us and we possess it. And while the wording in Ephesians 1.11 means that, it means that God has given us something, he's actually referring to the knowledge of the will of God that comes earlier in the chapter. He says that God has given you the knowledge of his will, the knowledge of his redemption. He has given you a faith that you believe and that inheritance doesn't just mean that you obtain this knowledge and carry it with you. It means a heritage. It means that not only has it been passed to you, but now you have an obligation to pass it on to others.
And so I ask you, what's your legacy? What's your legacy as a mother? Because it is Mother's Day. What's your legacy as a parent, a father, an uncle, an aunt, grandmother, grandfather, cousin, but even as a churchgoer? As a believer in Christ, what's your legacy? Because at the end of my life, and, it, and we've attended funerals quite often, and you get a piece of paper and it says that this person was survived by these people in their family or they might have worked and it gives a summary of maybe the jobs they had or the type of man or woman that you were when you passed away. Is that all you want that is said about you? Or do you want to be known as someone who loved God and shared that love of God with others so that they too have the opportunity to grow in the same experiences and the same faith that you have? I'm just going to end it right there. I'm just going to say a prayer. But I am going to ask that if you have any prayer requests, to comment them down in this video. Um, and what, what I know I'll personally do, I'm sure I won't be the only one, but if you're an administrative council member or a leader in this church, go back and watch this video. Look at the comments. Pray for the requests that are in the comments. I'm going to do the same. That I might not be a member of this church, but I feel like family when I come here because I've got family who come here. But I've grown up in and out of this church myself. And so I'm going to pray for you too. And I'm specifically going to pray for you moms. So if you'll just bow your heads right where you are, we're going to pray and then we're just going to close the service out. I'm just at, at, at the end of this prayer, we're just going to be done. I thank you for joining us online today. Um, I pray that God spoke to you through this sermon. Um, happy Mother's Day again to all of our moms watching and everyone that may watch later on. Um, God, God bless you. I love you. Um, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for who you are and for what you said today. I pray that it went through uh, the, the video and into the, the homes and in the hearts and minds of those that were watching. I pray, Lord God, that there was an impact that was made, but that we are challenged to live according to your standard and to pass on the knowledge of you to others. That we'll be challenged to pour into not only the next generation, but to our neighbor right down the road, the person that whenever we come back into church and we have church physically in Oak Grove again, Lord God, that they'll be willing to, to share their testimony, even with the person sitting next to them or in the pew in front or behind them. Make us into a church family and to be the people that you want us to be. Thank you for every mother. I pray that you honor them today, bless them today, make them feel loved, help them to feel loved as we love them the best way we can. In Jesus' name, amen.